Chapter 17 deals with evolution of animals. And so this is the next step when it comes to uh, getting bigger organisms from what we've seen before. The first part of this is how do you get to having multicellular organisms that are actually large and have hollow areas on the inside and and then of course that sets it up to have organ systems and to have circulatory systems and all kinds of other body systems and in order to understand how this works we have to remember what we're starting with we're starting with unicellular organisms and unicellular organisms exist today the question therefore is why would any organism actually decide to combine with other organisms now you've probably heard the the old adage there is strength in numbers and the question therefore is what is the particular strength in numbers when it comes to this in terms of the overall timing the aggregation of some of these protists happened probably about 750 million years ago and there wasn't really that much opportunity for different organisms to get together because there really weren't that many there at the time. So the question then still remains, why did this actually happen? The advantage that you can ferret out when you're working together is that not everybody, not all cells have to do everything. If you are working together, then you can divide labor, if you will, and therefore one type of cell can focus on one specific thing and another type of cell could do something entirely different and yet the two of them support each other and that is where the advantage lies so let's start out with an early colony and this colony is simply an aggregation of a whole bunch of identical cells now if you look at an individual cell on the outside here so there's there's a little cell what does that cell actually need to do? Well, obviously, it needs to help feed the colony because it's on the outside and that's where the food particles would be. It also has a little flagellum and so it is also involved in locomotion. And then, of course, it may have other functions such as defense or maybe um, it, it is one of those sacrificial ones that if another organism comes and try to eat it, eat this colony, then, well, some of them are going to be eaten. And the ones on the outside are obviously the ones first in line. And then, of course, these cells have to reproduce. So this kind of cell has to do all kinds of things. But it is on the outside. It's on the surface. And so there are some advantages. It does have first access to food. It can help the colony move it can reproduce so those are also advantages so that cell is okay but imagine for a minute what happens to a cell that's on the inside of this now not the cell that's facing us but one that's actually inside of that cluster it doesn't have immediate access to food it doesn't have immediate access to external nutrition it cannot help move the colony and so it is actually at a disadvantage now, being on the deep inside of one of these colonies is perhaps not the best way to live. So what do you need to do if you want to grow? You cannot make a larger cluster because of the disadvantages to the cells on the inside. What you do instead is you form a hollow sphere. A hollow sphere means that now all cells are on the outside. All cells are able to contribute just as the external ones were able to do here and there are no internal sort of left behind kind of cells that don't have access to anything this is a nice arrangement if you're going to grow larger so there could be hundreds of cells literally and hundreds of these cells all able to function properly so this is a pretty good arrangement that's a first step now if you have so many different cells that are all doing the same thing then very quickly you get to the point where not all of these are actually needed to do everything. If these cells can figure out how to share, sharing is good, and then what they could do is differentiate some of them out. So these reproductive cells have now become 
independent in terms of what they're doing. They're not doing everything. They're not doing the locomotion. They may still be able to pick up nutrients, but on behalf of everybody else, they are the ones involved in reproduction. So now you have the beginning of specialization. Think about it this way. If you want to grow a company, you probably have to add employees. That makes it bigger, right? And then it works best if you look at large companies today, if you have one department that does shipping, one department that does you know, orders, one department that does manufacturing, one department that does accounting, you divide the labor and that's how you can create greater efficiency in a complex environment. This is starting to be, become a complex environment with specialization. Now what do you do when you have a specialized set of cells? Well you need to make sure that if they serve your entire organism that those cells are in a safe place and so one of the things that cells probably did or cell clusters probably did at that time is they began to fold inward there are lots of good reasons for folding inward some of these we've already encountered when it came to endosymbiosis folding inwards means that first of all you increase the surface area where things can happen you're folding it inwards, which means it gives it a certain amount of protection. And in addition, those specialized cells can also become protected. Now, if you bring this to its conclusion, you end up with a dual layered system. The dual layer means that there's an internal layer of cells here and an external layer of cells there. So now you have exposure to the outside and you have exposure on the inside, this is where you can put the food. Now it says here it's a gastrula-like proto-animal. The gastrula is what happens in our cells as we develop. It forms. And if you, if you look at development, development tends to go through all the evolutionary steps of a type of organism. And in our case, we start out with a cluster of cells. We start out with a single cell, of course, but then we have a cluster of cells. That cell buds out, or rather forms a hollow sphere, and then it goes through all these steps. In our development, this also has a name, that's called a blastula. So this blastula then starts to differentiate, fold inward, and then you end up with the gastrula. So we, in our own development, go through the earliest steps of evolution to make multicellular life. And the reason why we go through this is because that's how it has to happen. You don't just collect cells randomly and stick them together. You start with a single one and you grow it from that one out. They don't all flock together and then you try and arrange it. No, that's not what happens. You start with a single one and that one then becomes its own colony and that one then becomes its own proto-animal. So this is the evolution of animals in its very uh, beginning stages. Now that led eventually to all kinds of multicellular life. This is what's known as the Cambrian, Cambrian explosion. The Cambrian is a time period about 545 million years ago. And that's when all kinds of animal body plans are visible in the fossil record. Some of them crazy, but there they were. I mean, you end up with something like this, this thing here with five eyes. One, two, three, four, five eyes and a vacuum tube. And then the rest of it kind of looks like a shrimp. It's got these, this weird stuff. Well, it didn't last. It eventually went extinct. We don't have anything like that right now because perhaps natural selection said it doesn't work very well. So let's not have that anymore. But we do have things back then, multicellular life, that we have now, including things like sponges, including things like jellyfish, and so on. And so there are a lot of things that began when any kind of animal life began. And that's what we call the Cambrian explosion. It's really interesting when you look at all the major phyla, the diversity of life that exists today, most of them 
go way back to the Cambrian. We have fossil individuals, fossil species that are just like that. Now, when it comes to figuring out how animals are related based on that initial explosion, how, how did they actually come about? I mean, how do you build an animal that's more complex, and then how do you increase the complexity based on that? And so you use a variety of data sets. Obviously, nowadays, we, we can use molecular data sets, but they are sometimes uh, confusing. They, they don't necessarily give us immediately what we're looking for. So it does help to look at comparative anatomy and embryology, both of which were key factors in uh, how we learned about evolution to begin with. And so in this uh, situation, we're going to look at four key branching points in animal evolution. I mentioned to you before <laughs> that you have a, a population of organisms and it, it moves along the same branch and then something happens and the branch splits. So that split would be a branching point. And in this case, we're going to look at this large scale, not just in terms of species, speciation, but we're looking at large scale evolution. So the first part of this is the development of true tissues. The development of true tissues means you don't just have a loose assembly, but you go from a loose assembly of cells, oops, assembly, loose assembly, you're starting to go to an actual cell and tissue arrangement. So these tissues, in tissues rather, the cells are not able to just go out and be by themselves. So this is a, a major thing in the development of multicellularity where you don't just have a loose assemblage but you actually have real tissues. The second thing is the evolution of a more complex body symmetry. Now the easiest symmetry in any natural environment is something that's rounded, radial. If you think of drop of water, right? You, it splashes and it's sort of a round arrangement. If you think of the cell itself, it's kind of a round arrangement. So that is the primitive condition. Round things tend to be the way nature works. And in terms of body symmetry, we have this as well. We call it radial symmetry. And radial symmetry means that any which way you cut through the organism, you end up finding two equal halves. You can do this with a pizza. If you look at the pizza and you cut it in half, well, you got two equal halves. You don't have to cut it exactly there. You can cut it here, too, and you still end up with two equal halves. Or two equal halves like that. So any which way you do it, that's radial symmetry. So a pizza is radially, radially symmetric if you cut it through that radial arrangement. Our symmetry is different. We have bilateral symmetry. Bilateral means two sides. We have two-sided symmetry. Two-sided in this case means that you have an organism, if you slice it right down the middle, you end up with two slides that are each other's mirror images. Now, they don't have to be perfect mirror images, but just in terms of the overall structures and functionality, you end up with two sides. Now, if you were to cut yourself in half, you would have to do it so that you always end up with, two, uh, with one of each on both sides. So you have two eyes, you have to cut through the middle, so if one eye on one side, one eye on the other. Now, obviously, there are different ways you can cut yourself in half, right? You can, you can just you know, trim yourself uh, right in the middle of the stomach. You can slice yourself in half backward and forward, but that's not lateral. Two equal sides, that's the way you cut. And this is what's shown here in the, the lobster. So that's a more complex body symmetry. Next, you have the development of a true body cavity. And the true body cavity basically gives you more layers, more layers on the inside with which to do things. If you're looking at some very simple organisms that do not have a body cavity, such as the flatworm, you find that they're basically stuffed full with muscle tissue. So there's some muscular arrangement on the outside, and this space in the middle is also filled. And in the middle, in yellow, you have the gut and it is completely embedded in 
the tissue. So there's no flexibility, there's no movement, there are no multiple layers, and, and that's it. If you start looking at a body cavity, there is a fluid-filled compartment, fluid instead of solid. That can be an advantage because it gives you a little bit of flexibility. And it separates the outer body from the digestive tract. That's what I mean by layers. You start to see distinct layers. And if you have that cavity, it comes in basically two types. You have a pseudo coelom, which means it is a body cavity, but, but it's still a little rudimentary. It's a little bit like a garden hose. So you have an outer layer that's pretty strong. You have an inner layer of muscle tissue. And then the, the gut in the middle is kind of floating in there not held together properly. And this is the kind of thing you'll find in roundworms, nematode worms. They're very small, usually. You may know them as vinegar eels, but they're very, very useful in how they uh, help turn over the soil and so on. And then lastly, for any more advanced organisms, you have what's called a true coelom. And the true coelom has not only an outer layer and an inner layer, but that inner layer now extends to cover the gut and holds it together. So you still have the multiple layers the way you did up here, but now the gut is held in one of these layers and it makes it a little bit more secure than if you're just having it uh, slapping around in the open space. So this is the more advanced version with more layers than anywhere else, and so you can do more with a, a body like that. So that's the third thing. Then the fourth thing, when you look at the embryonic development and how things are laid down in different organisms, there are two main types. First off, the deuterostomes, which includes you and I, and also it includes sea stars and sea urchins and sand dollars and those kind of things. Those are the deuterostomes. And their characteristic is, first of all, when this initial infolding happens. Now remember, the infolding is where you have that hollow sphere, and then there is an infolding. That infolding here, that becomes the anus. There's only two openings, two main openings in the body that we need to account for, the anus and the mouth. Well, in deuterostomes, it becomes the anus. And then, on top of that, the coelom develops from the gut. That means the gut itself, that, that little yellow layer that you saw on the previous slide, it is the one that produces the cells that eventually hold it in place. And that's called enterocele. Entero means internal. Cele related to the coelom. So it's the coelom formed from the inside out. Now, the other group is called the protostomes, and obviously all these characteristics are going to be the opposite of what I just told you. In protostomes, which is everybody else, the first embryonic infolding becomes the mouth, and the coelom develops from a variety of cells that are just floating around in the middle of the body. So rather than having it centered and come from the inside, it comes from different cell masses, multiple places, and that's called schizocele. The, the term schizo or schizo is related to schizophrenia, right? Multiple personalities, and that's how we can call, call this. So multiple cell masses, the coelom develops from multiple different places. So that's schizocele, schizocele. So those are the four main steps in development. Now, if you look at the main groups of organisms, and they're listed on top of this slide, uh, you'll find that they're put in an order according to how the branching occurred using those four characteristics I just described. So if you go to the very bottom of the tree, that is obviously where you find everything here initially, where there was no differentiation, where you had the first very simple multicellular organisms, but their cells were not true tissues. And so multicellular multicellularity, where a bunch of cells just got together and did their thing, that's what we started out with. So that, in this case, is 
the, the trunk of this family tree of animals. The next thing that happens is you had one group that simply remained multicellular and did not have any true tissues and so this is the first split. Those are still around and they still don't have any proper tissues and those are the sponges. On the other hand everything else all the other organisms on this family tree they do have true tissues. So that was the first significant change that turned multicellular organisms into something a little bit more advanced. Now among those that have true tissues there are some that have radial symmetry and this radial symmetry is seen in jellies and their relatives. So jellyfish in anemones, uh, there, there are other kinds of organisms that are closely related and these all have radial symmetry. So if you slice them like a pizza you get two equal parts. Everybody else along here has bilateral symmetry which is the next most complex thing. Now we start with the different types <coughs> of coelom. First of all, do you have a coelom or not? If you don't have one, then you're probably a flatworm. If you do have one, you can be any of these other things. Moving into the tree a little bit further, there is a differentiation between the pseudo coelom that makes you a roundworm, and the true coelom, which is everybody else. And then finally, you have the, the two steps where you differentiate between the coelom from cell masses, that's schizocele, and you have the coelom from the gut. So enterocele and schizocele here. And enterocele is for sea stars and vertebrates, and schizocele is for mollusks, worms, and arthropods. So this is a way that you can look at the, the basic development of multi, uh, multicellular animals. This, this is the kind of thing that you, you'd see. And this has held up very well when it comes to molecular data as well. So these four things are listed here because those happen to be the most fundamental aspects of what makes us as animals. And that's the end of...